and welcome everyone. I'd like to thank Emily Euler from Hybrid Arts and Clara Davison from the Office of Development for their help in organizing this webinar. My name is Anna Galboy and I'm Associate Professor of Music Theory here at Ohio State. I will be moderating today's discussion. I'm joined by four panelists, all graduate students in the School of Music, Andrew Eikhoff, Sam Burgess, Ben Shaheen, and Amelia Duplain. I'm going to now share um, a presentation. All right, I will begin by providing a brief overview of our topic today, and then I'll introduce each panelist and they will give a short presentation on their creative work. We'll then open up the webinar for questions and please use the Q&A feature. Um, if you have a specific question for one of our presenters, I'll be sure to direct your question to them. So there is a vast field of creative activity that takes the visualization of music as its starting point. New technologies have made it easier than ever before to combine music, movement, and visual design, either in live or pre-recorded forms. Recent research into cognition and perception have provided new insights into audiovisual processing and have identified commonly held associations between aural and visual stimuli. My own interest in this subject comes from my collaborative work with video artists and lighting designers to produce media for live orchestral performance, most recently with the Royal Concertgebouw in Amsterdam. The impulse to translate music into visual form is an ancient one. But in the early 20th century, many modernist artists looked to music as an inspiration for new forms of creative expression. For example, the painter and amateur cellist, Vasily Kandinsky wrote, the richest lessons are to be learned from music. Kandinsky developed a style of painting based on musical relationships of contrast, consonance, opposition, and development. In 1925, the choreographer, Ruth St. Dennis, defined music visualization as the scientific translation into bodily action of the rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic structure of a musical composition. She and her partner, Ted Shawn, developed a series of dances that attempted to reproduce each parameter of a musical texture precisely. The relatively new medium of film allowed other artists to mobilize musicalized imagery, and after 1929, pair it with a fixed audio track. Filmmakers such as Oscar Fischinger created films that relied on the close synchronization of music with abstract animation, a style of experimental filmmaking that was popularized in Disney's Fantasia. For half a century now, pop music performances have included synchronized visual designs involving lights, pyrotechnics, video production, and dance. This visual abundance ex is exemplified in popular entertainment such as The Masked Singer, or in touring shows such as Drake's and Australasian Boy Meets World Tour, which featured, among other visuals, hundreds of glowing kinetic spheres that were synchronized with the music. The visualization of music is integral to a broad range of mass popular entertainments, such as the amazing line rider choreography set to music by YouTuber Doodle Chaos, or the musical fountain shows at Burj Khalifa Lake in Dubai. Every one of these forms requires a series of artistic decisions regarding the interaction of music and visual design. One question concerns the synchronization of visual and musical events in time. Visual, visuals can synchronize with the music at the level of the beat or the measure or the phrase, and they can interact with musical rhythms in complex accentual patterns. The second question concerns how music and visuals relate via shared qualities such as density, intensity, roughness, smoothness, highness, lowness, warmth, and coolness. For example, Researchers have identified that uh, large numbers of the population have a common expectation that a high loud sound would be paired with a bright sharp image, while a low quiet sound would be paired with a darker rounder image. However, in audiovisual composition, it seldom makes aesthetic sense to fulfill such expectations mechanically. 
The third question relates to issues of meaning. Visuals and music can work together to produce a certain mood or affect, or they can interact to produce new meanings that are not available to either music or the visuals alone. The four projects you will hear about today are speculative in nature. Each creator began with a more specific set of questions than those I've listed here and produced a plan for production that can only be finalized once the COVID era restrictions on live performance are lifted. However, I think it's important to recognize that since the earliest days, audiovisual composition has always had the speculative element as creators pushed against the limits of technology, circumstance, and their imagination. So now I would like to introduce our first panelist, Andrew Eikop. He is a graduate teaching assistant in music theory, and he is also pursuing a DMA in composition here at Ohio State. This project presents uh, represents an important first exploratory step in creating multimedia composition with the aim of visually representing music. He will discuss um, synesthesia and audiovisual composition. Welcome, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, my project is basically trying to present the synesthetic experience as I experience it um, in, in a visual, visual medium. Um, and so what I have found are certain qualities of music that can be uh, relayed uh, through, through this visual medium. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, first of all, we have pitch which I represent as pitch height, um, basically uh, where it exists in the field, as well as I have a color thing um, that I can share with you. Uh, here are my pitch colors. If you're not familiar with synesthesia, I recommend you take a look. Uh, hang on, I have a chat. Uh, thing. Okay. Yes. So here are the Loudon um, audio and visual intramodal associations, which are very studied, and it's it's very interesting in that the synesthetic experience uh, kind of follows this. For example, um, the soft like if it's something soft, it's going it's going to be smaller. If it's loud, it's, it's larger. If it's lower in pitch, it's lower in the visual field. If it's higher, it's higher in the visual field. Um, so I can, I can uh, supplement all of these things um, in some other medium if anyone needs to, to see it. We have a pretty short time schedule here. So uh, anywho, the... Um, so I started with a uh, piano, and this is synthesized piano, to be fair. Uh, all right. And I wanted to show visual uh, intervals in, the, in, in that when you have intervals, there is a certain unsteadiness. There is a shakiness to the uh, visual quality when there is dissonance. So, so let's take a look of piano intervals. Okay, so I hope you could appreciate the, uh, so first of all, I use the colors that are my personal colors for notes. Uh, that is not objective. However, the um, relationship between uh, interval quality uh, is, uh, I think, somewhat, sub, uh, somewhat objective in that the, there is a, uh, with dissonance, 
you see a certain um, movement uh, between notes. And so um, let's move on to uh, the timbre of individual instruments is uh, very important. Uh, so with string, so that was that was piano. So each, so <laughs> it's so hard to cover in five minutes. Um, the timbre is extremely important for this particular project. Um, the attack, decay, release of each uh, instrument needs to needs to be represented. And so here is my representation of strings. Um, let me show you this if I can. All right. So this is so okay, so strings. Okay, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm dealing with uh chat things. Uh anywho, here are strings. Um which I, I hope can represent the timbre a bit more. It's also including the color, which I should be clear, the color is not something I experience with synesthesia. It is something I experience when I'm reading, reading it on the page. So it's a separate thing, but I think it provides clarity. Eh, yeah. Anywho, uh, sorry, uh, there's a lot to deal with here. Okay, here's, here's strings. Okay, so so <laughs> I know it's a very quick thing, but um, yeah, synesthesia as a way to uh, represent music visually. I think we are out of time, actually. So I hope to hear from you in the questions uh, and all that. Thank you for your time. All right. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Our next presenter is Sam Burgess. Sam is a dual master's student in music theory and orchestral conducting at Ohio State. Her research net investigates emotional responses to music and how theoretical concepts in music can be more effectively communicated to an audience by conductors and performers. She is presenting a visualization of Antonine Dvorak's New World Symphony. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm just going to briefly pull up my screen share and we'll dive in. All right. All right, I'm really excited to take you through my project, which is an audiovisual exploration of Dvorak's New World Symphony. So as Dr. Grabway mentioned, I am both a conductor and a music theorist and the interaction of these two interests or a combination of these interests for me led me to this kind of broad creative question of how can audiovisual musical multimedia be used to enhance the concert going experience of classical music performance. So to me, the Dvorak's New World Symphony is a piece that already had just personal visual connotations. And so I decided to use it as kind of a case study or a point of inquiry to explore this question a little more. So using this piece, I delved into some more specific questions of what aspects of performance unique to live concerts do I wanna highlight through visual media? And what aspects of the piece specifically do I want to highlight? So based on my analysis of the piece and just kind of the experience I wanted to bring to the audience, I came up with these four things that I wanted to cover in my visual. I wanted them to be very specific and congruent to the elements of the score that I as a conductor would want to highlight in performance. I wanted them to immerse the audience in the audiovisual experience, not just have them watch it. So kind of bring the audience into that performance space. I wanted to make use of and highlight the performance space itself, as well as use the visuals to construct an abstract narrative of the piece that kind of mirrored or was based on the piece's structure. So this idea of hall specific was design was actually inspired by our local Ohio theater, um, which to me personally is just one of the most beautiful concert halls I've ever been in. And I was really interested 
particularly inspired by this beautiful space of how could I bring the space into the performance? So I kind of identified some elements of the architectural design of the, the space that I could highlight in a design. So these are things such as the ornate columns, the gilded paint, this like beautiful recessed ceiling, uh, the boxes on the side of the hall, the curtains, all of that I think are elements that with visual design, you can kind of bring out or highlight about the space. So a little bit about my artistic process or how I developed my visuals. So I had analyzed this score as a conductor um, and then I went back through in my visual design, specifically I've started with the second movement because it had the strongest visual connotations for me. Um, I went back through and kind of notated how I would make my visuals. You can see a few different things happening on this sample page of the score. In blue are my markings that I made previously as a conductor. So these are my markings to me to know like what gestures I need to make with my hands. There are also these gestures in red. So those are aspects of the visual design that are extremely um, time specific. So you can see this one on this page here is notating that the sun is coming up over the horizon. So that's the visual and it's timed exactly with that timpani roll that hits and is accented on beat two. There's also these annotations in green, which are more like ambient stage direction, kind of like mood lighting, I'm calling them. So they are still somewhat time specific and have general, um, general beats or measures in which I want them to come into play, but they're less um, tied to like a specific note or accent within the music. And then the things highlighted in yellow are just little textural elements or um, elements of musical counterpoint that I thought were interesting and that I could also bring out in my design. So I will now take you through two mock-ups of like little phrases from this movement that I have made into video. So this first clip is the very beginning of the movement. Movement two is the slow movement of this symphony. It is a chorale introduction to this beautiful slow brass chorale and it features a sunrise, it's kind of the visual I've chosen, which frames the narrative of the piece because this same chorale comes back at the end of the movement. So this sunrise sunset is kind of this like narrative that I'm constructing. Um, so you'll see here, the sun will rise slowly above the horizon as the chorale grows in volume. And that clip is using kind of the ceiling as the architectural feature that I'm highlighting. In this next clip, you'll see a different section of the movement. So this is from the B section. It's a contrasting section from the middle of this movement. And you have to imagine, there's a little bit of imagination required for this one. So there's these two visual elements. There's the dappled blue light. And you wanna imagine that that's being like projected down onto the floor, so onto the audience. And then on the top of the screen, you see these like water droplets that are like hitting the surface of water as if you're looking on it from below. So the idea here is that this visual being projected onto the ceiling and the floor is gonna create the sense that the audience is like underwater, experiencing this phrase like from within the visual. Um, the light on the floor is just more of like an ambient lighting, whereas the water droplets hitting on the ceiling will be timed with the cello pizzicato that you'll hear in this phrase. You'll also hear these little string flourishes that go along with the phrase, and those are things that could have extra visual effects added later on to kind of highlight those little textural elements in the music as well. Here we go.
Okay. So hopefully those two clips give you kind of a sense of how I'm using the space and using the visuals to highlight the music and bring the audience into that performance. So in the future of this project, I wanna keep working with it, um, con continue developing imagery. I have like a plan outline for the whole second movement. I would like to continue and do the rest of the movements in the symphony. And like ideally as a conductor, I would love to perform it one day with an ensemble or help um, collaborate with artists, other artists to fully realize this project and have it be something that people can experience in not just on the screen. So yeah, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Sam. Our next presenter is Ben Shaheen. He is a graduate teaching associate for the percussion studio while he pursues his DMA in percussion performance. He is interested in creating visualizations for existing works to engage more senses for the audience. His presentation is a visualization of Eric Awazin's Northern Lights. Yes, hi everybody. I'm so excited to share this uh, guide for an audiovisual performance of the Marimba Solo Northern Lights. Um, I don't necessarily have the technical abilities to put the full performance together on my own. So I started last semester making this guide um, for a full performance. The scene that I imagine is a dark, empty stage with just a marimba stage center and some sort of projection mapping or projection of images of the Northern Lights on directly onto the performer, filling out the entire stage and creating a more immersive atmosphere for the audience and the performer. Very similar to what Sam was doing with her symphony, probably on a smaller scale due to the nature of the piece, a marimba solo versus an entire symphony. So right off the bat, at the beginning of the semester, I realized I needed to answer some questions. How could I relate this project to the course? The main, re the main way I realized I could do that was through congruence. The idea of congruence, um, media matching the composition in some way. And I realized also that I could match the composition to the actual Northern Lights and the media to the actual Northern Lights. Um, I'm hoping that it will be created images, not actual images of the phenomenon. So I started off with research on how the actual Northern Lights work. And this is a very Cliff Notes version of it. I'm not a scientific brain um, by any means necessary, but I learned that solar particles travel from the sun and they collide with either oxygen or nitrogen particles in our atmosphere. Different shapes and colors are created depending on the rate of that collision, the altitude above the earth, and the type of particle in which that um, the solar particles collide with, again, oxygen or nitrogen. So knowing this, I had to figure out exactly which colors uh, happened in the Northern Lights. And I realized that these colors in this table were likely the most common colors that would be seen or more rare colors as you can see down here in the bottom. So the most common color that you that are, is seen with the Northern Lights is this yellowish green, um, which you'll see in a couple slides. And I actually use this color throughout the piece most consistently. Because it is the most common, I felt like I can draw on that aspect to draw a little bit of congruence. Uh, this yellowish green color happens at a, about a 50 to 150 miles above the earth. Uh, the green compared to a color like the deep red, which is significantly more rare, and it's going to happen at a much higher altitude as well. I don't necessarily use this red as often throughout the piece due to it's more rare, uh, and it's going to be a lot more intense uh, in terms of uh, solar activity. Then I had to figure out what shapes are present, and I realized that these are the most common shapes or really all of the shapes that are, are seen in the Northern Lights. I wanna highlight two, uh, arcs and coronas. Arcs are likely the most common um, that can be seen. If you go and see the Northern Lights, you will likely see an arc. I use this most commonly through the piece to represent uh, a theme that comes back about four or five times throughout the piece. It's the corral theme. You'll hear it at the end of my presentation. And then the coronas, which are extremely rare entities. You actually very rarely see these. So I use these 
three times throughout the piece. So I'm drawing on some conclusion can, um, congruence here. So this is a, an arc that's a corona, much more vibrant, much more exciting. They're used in very, very intense climaxes of the piece. The guide itself is broken up into eight different scenes. I make decisions on color, shape, intensity, and motion of the, of the media. And to make those decisions, I draw on musical devices. Um, so the ranges and the register of the instrument are going to correlate with the altitude of the color. Uh, so higher up in the, in, in the instrument is going to get a red or um, a pink color that's higher altitudes. And then the intensity of tempo, dynamics, and harmonic motion are going to help me make decisions on the intensity of the shape, the intensity uh, of the color, and um, how fast the colors will move. Really quickly, this is what the uh, first scene looks like. I break each scene up into smaller parts. Usually it's based on um, different themes or something new that comes through. Um, it's pretty simple and I keep it purposely vague. Um, this guide is meant to help my collaborator hopefully in the future. Again, I do not have the technical abilities to make this happen. Um, so I'll have to work with somebody. Uh, and I keep it vague in spots so that my collaborator can make artistic decisions. The idea of a certain shape might be completely different from what I think it is, and that's okay with me. Um, and I also realized at the end of the semester that congruence is not always necessary. Uh, the Northern Lights are very unpredictable, uh, and there should be a hint of that in the media. Uh, not every fade in and fade out should be met with a swell in the and a decrescendo in the media as well. This is a video that I put together at the end of last semester. It's a short mock-up. It's not at all the vision that I'm hoping to create, but it will show you some of the congruence that could happen and the colors as well. So I'm gonna show about 30 seconds of this because I'm sure I'm about out of time. Yes, so over the next year or so, hopefully as things open up with COVID um, and funding starts to fall into place, I'll look to look for a collaborator and put this performance together. Um, I think it'll be a really awesome performance potentially. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Our final presenter is Amelia Duplain. She is a first year master's student studying percussion performance. She began tap dancing at four years old and the rhythmic complexities of this dance genre are what inspired her to later study and pursue percussion. She will present on her original tap dance and snare drum composition. Yeah, hello. I am just going to jump right in here for the sake of time. All right, so my goals when deciding to, you know, start this composition were to incorporate two art forms that I'm passionate about, tap dance and, you know, percussion, because I've not seen a lot of that. I wanted to explore both rhythmic counterpoint and audiovisual counterpoint between snare drum and tap dance, and I wanted to explore tap dance as an instrument. So my methodology, I actually began by notating the rhythms of common tap dance steps because this is something that I had never really seen or worked with before. So seeing these rhythms helped me begin my composition. So then next I wrote a snare drum motif and then I found tap steps that rhythmically fit into this motif. And so ultimately that means that the rhythms that I wrote in the snare drum part ultimately dictated my tap choreography. And here is just a quick picture of my notation. So for tap dance, which is on the bottom line, I wrote all the rhythms on one line. And so I 
had a classmate tell me I could have approached this by writing each tap sound with a, either a different note head or on a different line, but this just felt easier to read for me. All right, so let's listen to a little bit of this. All right, so some conclusions that I have drawn from this experience. It is a lot easier to be rhythmically precise on snare drum with than with tap dance, which seems obvious in retrospect, but because I mean, obviously when you're playing snare drum, you're just using your hands and your fingers mostly. And with tap dance, you're using mostly your legs and your whole body. And it's just a lot easier to be precise with your hands and with your feet really. And also my other conclusion is that a given tempo feels drastically different as a musician than as a dancer, which is something that I had again, not anticipated. But what this means is that I ended up around um, 70 beats per minute for this composition and on snare drum, 70 beats per minute feels like plenty of time to fit in, you know, rolls and any grace notes, just plenty of time, but then as a tap dancer to try to do anything intricate like turns or you know pickups which I feel like mere grace notes on snare drum was very very difficult to do at that tempo and so this you know what's next if I am going to maybe have a second attempt at a project like this in order to combat rhythmic clarity and tempo discrepancies it may be beneficial to write the tap dance choreography first so then I kind of can know the limitations that I'm working within right off the bat for the tap dance specifically, and then be able to incorporate potentially, you know, snare drum or other percussive instruments. So, so that was my project. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for presenting. So we have two compositions that are audiovisual in nature. Um, meaning that the music and the visuals are produced at the same time by the same person. So Amelia's um, composition and Andrew's composition. And then two others that involved visuals that are composed for an, a pre-existing piece of music. And we had a question come up, um, doesn't the introduction of visual images detract from appreciating or concentrating on the sonic patterns of the music? Um, let's discuss. Sam, would you like to begin? Yeah, so I can jump in and answer this question. This is a great question. Um, one might think so, but actually, so a lot of my research in music theory is like cognition based and what the cognitive studies show is actually the opposite, especially um, as a function of like musical training and musical experience that visual cues actually help to parse, help, help a listener to parse out the um, textures in a piece, particularly um, I guess I'm interested in this because orchestral textures are so complex, right? And you want to help people be able to hear all the intricacies of that. And it's been shown in studies that using visual cues and that cross-modal congruence can actually strengthen the connections there and help um, a listener to hear more of the texture and more of what's going on in the piece. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Yeah, so... Um... Ben, you had the other composition that adds visuals, and I know that you've done a lot of work looking at um, emerging forms of performance and where performance might be going in the future. Um, perhaps you could speak a little to this question. Yeah, you know, I, um, in the past, I've done both a composition that was uh, 
composed with media in mind and a composition where we added media later on, both with an orchestra. And I can truly say that those, those performances were two of the most, two of the performances that I probably personally remember as a performer the most, and that my friends and family who were at those concerts still talk about the most. Um, I think that the, what the video, the visual media will do is it will draw attention to a certain thing that you might not necessarily hear. Uh, it might not be the most important aspect, but then this trickle down across the media happens. And it's just this slight thing in the violins that you would never ever notice. Um, my hope <laughs> as a performer is that we start seeing these audiovisual uh, performances happen more often. I think that it's a way to get young audiences to orchestra concerts. I think it's a way to get more people and more audiences engaged in classical music. Uh, it is so different than it used to be and it can continue that way if this audiovisual idea um, continues to grow like it seems like it is. Yeah, great. We have a question about um, some technical specifics regarding these productions. Um, it's directed towards Sam, but I think that it could apply to um, to Ben's and um, and even Andrew's as well. Um, so Sam, my understanding is that your project's visuals are aligned manually with the music. Have you looked into processing live sound so that your work isn't specific to one recording? Yeah, Christina, thank you so much for this question. So I have a couple of things about this. So the mock-ups, yes, are specific to, um, to a recording because I've just made like a video um, sample essentially. And I didn't really have the technological expertise to tackle this issue of live synchronization. However, I know it has been done and actually some of Dr. Godboy's work works with this as well as like how how you can use technology to sync up these visuals and kind of perform them live. And the way that this is done is you kind of turn them into an instrument essentially, like some kind of like keyboard thing with like sliders or uh, buttons that allow you to manipulate different aspects of the video. Um, and you can kind of manipulate those in real time so that the, the conductor isn't constrained by the visuals and the visuals aren't constrained by the music. So it becomes more of a, live performance. Yeah, and I think um, what emerges from that approach is that the visuals begin to behave like a choreography or like a composition in its own right. Instead of just being this automatic mechanical thing, the music is automatically triggering um, a, a visual that's based on one parameter and it's the same throughout. Um, I think that that can um, be interesting for a short while, but once the audience determines like what parameter is the trigger, it kind of um, becomes a little bit boring because it always is sort of looking the same. Yeah, great. So we have a question from Michael Holm. This is for Amelia. Do you have any plans to use multiple dancers with multiple drums like a kit or maybe African drums? Um, I don't have any plans as of right now, but I think if we get to a point where, you know, we can have multiple dancers in a room post COVID. I would love to collaborate on something like that. But um, unfortunately for the scope of this project, I kind of had to just focus on what I could do by myself, but that would be a great thing to explore, yeah. Great. So this question is for Ben. Um, Phillips asks, I was wondering what made you decide on showing the display on the performer's stage rather than a screen behind them using the projector backstage? Yeah, so the performances I've done in the past, um, one of them was uh, an audiovisual performance of uh, Gustav Holst's The Planets. And we um, projected images of space and the planets themselves directly onto the ensemble. And there's something about that vision that immerses the audience into a bigger, better, more um, elaborate setting rather than just a projector screen, which works. I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I think for the idea that I'm trying to go for though, I want to immerse the audience, surround the audience with 
um, visualizations rather than just have it on one screen. And I think that that, um, in my own experience, has been a really um, a really important distinction. There is um, a more focused sense with a screen behind the performers, um, but it's a little bit artificial, and you really can get a more, um, uh, I think, a more complete combination with a, um, an immersive projection, um, just as the uh, the musician sound, musicians are filling the room with sound, you have projections or imagery also filling the room um, instead of being localized. Great. Um, so we have some questions that were submitted beforehand. Um, how do you see this research potentially shifting our consumption and production of media? This is a huge question. Um, I think we already touched on it a little bit. Um, but um, Ben, would you like to, to, um, to talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, and I think actually um, my answer now is different than my answer a year ago. Um, in this time of COVID, not to draw everything back to COVID, but it, it has been such a big part of our lives for a year. I have seen more audiovisual performances put out through social media and through other outlets um, than I ever have in my, in my career. Uh, I really think that it'll be interesting to see as things open up, will these audiovisual performances continue that happen like I think performers are probably sitting down and recording throughout a day rather than doing it live. Will they start to be molded with the way we used to do things and live performances the way we used to do things? I really hope so. <laughs> I really hope it does. And I really hope that those things begin to blend together the way that the world used to work and the way the world's working right now kind of blend into one. Um, because the, gr the grand scheme of things, I think that a lot of people for a long time are gonna feel uncomfortable going to live concerts. And I think that orchestras especially are going to have to do more than they already were doing to get audiences in the seats. And I think that this is one really great way, assuming funding lines up that, um, that orchestras can do that for sure. Yeah, Sam, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I will. I will second everything that Ben said. I actually, in the initial design phases of this project, I consulted with a few conductors who are kind of more established in the field um, and have been working for a long time. And they said exactly the same thing that you're, I think that we'll start to see a lot more of this thing, especially in the post, this kind of thing, especially in post COVID times um, that orchestras will be trying to do anything they can to get the audience into the seats and to make it a new experience and to kind of deliver that to an audience. But I also think just too that like ubiquitous, the ubiquitousness of technology is gonna lead to more of this as well. Like um, the tools to do this kind of thing are so readily available. Like I am a music theorist and a conductor. I am not a computer programmer. I am not a visual designer, but I was able to do those mock-ups just using like Adobe Premiere and kind of get my point across enough so that it is starting to kind of gain momentum and I kind of can see what it's going to be like. And I think that seeing that technology or having access to that technology is gonna make it a lot more feasible to execute these kind of projects and kind of foster those collaborations to do more of this, so, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, one of our um, attendees asks, I'm interested in the most effective ways of using face body group choreography to best support the meaning of a performed song. So Amelia, would you like to take that? Yeah, so actually last semester we had a guest speaker here at Ohio State named Hannah Kostrin and I'm gonna take some of the things I learned from her because I feel like that will be the best answer. So we learned about something called the Laban systems. And within that you have body, effort, and space. And body and space are pretty self-explanatory, but I'd like to go into effort. And there are four motion factors. There's space, weight, time, and flow. So space relates to where focus is directed, essentially. You can have direct and indirect. So indirect would be no sense of, of focus, or whereabouts in space. Weight would relate to 
your relationship to gravity or the dancer's relationship to gravity. So you can be strong and grounded or you can be light and resisting gravity. And time has to do with, you know, sudden breaks in ongoingness or a sustain, sustained sense of ongoingness. And lastly, flow relates to whether, you know, muscles are tensed and flexing or muscles are relaxed. And I feel like using specifically those four motion factors can really help convey certain things in certain compositions. Like I know specifically for me, I, because I was tap dancing along with the snare drum in my work, I wanted, you know, my motions to reflect the staccato nature of the snare drum. And so, you know, sudden motions that break the ongoingness of space and time I think can really convey things like that. And I think even face, facial expressions can fall into these categories as well. And um, obviously in my uh, composition, I couldn't really do that because I had a mask on, <laughs> but I don't know. That would be my answer. Yeah, thank you. So um, we have a, a comment from Blake Stevens. I think the question about the potential in interference of visuality with orality is deserving of a historical perspective, one that would engage, for instance, with Pierre Schaeffer's influential contested account of reduced listening and the acousmatic experience. Perhaps what is needed is greater differentiation between distinct musical practices, contexts, audiences, and musicians. In other words, perhaps the singular music is a misnomer with these kinds of questions. Um, so, um, Andrew, are you, uh, I saw that you kind of made a motion to answer this. Would you like to? Yeah, I was typing an answer at the time, actually. <laughs> I don't quite understand this question. Um, are you suggesting that there's, um, a, uh, some dissonance between the two things? Like, this is a very, it seems like a very big question that, uh, doesn't have an easy answer, unfortunately. Um, so in, in other words, perhaps the singular music is a misnomer. I, I'm not sure I quite understand uh, where you might be uh, coming from. Well, so uh, I, have a, I have two thoughts. One is that um, in my experience, the people who have been most resistant to this have been people who have been um, the most invested in the idea of absolute music, which is a very um, old idea. It arose in the 19th century, and it still governs a lot of our, um, you know, it's kind of a hidden background in a lot of our approach to presenting, uh, you know, quote unquote, classical music. Um, in the in the modern classical music industry landscape, there's this idea that you are going to come into a performance space, there is going to be silence, you will sit quietly and you will listen potentially with your eyes closed so that nothing um, disrupts the pure oral experience that is profound. And I know that many people um, enjoy listening to music this way, um, but it is not the only way and um, the, the people who are most um, comfortable listening that way are, um, are, not, um, are not going to be around that much longer to put it quite, quite frankly. Um, and so some of the, the things that Ben and, and Sam and our other panelists were saying about inviting new audiences into these pieces, inviting them to have a different type of listening experience than we would expect um, a listener in the 19th century to have, I think is a, a really important conversation to have. Um, I, because of the nature of audiovisual processing, a lot of the visualizations are inherently reductive. So they do not, um, I don't think that it is um, visually satisfying to um, 
to represent every single aspect of a really complex musical texture. <laughs> it's just um, we, we process visual stimuli um, slower than we do aural stimuli. And so we have to make strategic choices about what parameters we are choosing to pair with our visuals. And so I think that there's a lot of creative potentials that emerge within that, um, within that um, domain. But um, we are dealing with a living practice. I mean, I think that there is a place for historically situated performance, um, but there also is these new and emerging creative modes of presentation that um, might not be in a concert hall. <laughs> they, might not, they might be in a park with lighted trees. They might be in a shell with, a, um, with a, um, like an overhang. And so um, I think we're in the mode of thinking very openly about these things, um, thinking about the future of our art. So that was a long answer. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we have a question from um, Brooke Butler. Has the potential for incorporating technology in live, uh, I'm sorry, has, has the potential for incorporating live technology um, been incorporated into the design for the new mu music building? Um, I'll just answer that very quickly. That is um, a future stage. <laughs> there was no plan put in place to renovate the performance spaces. I believe that's going to be a separate part of our music renovations. Um, but if an artist musician wanted to begin exploring this integration, what technology or other tools would they need to begin? Um, so panelists, um, what advice do you have for someone who's just getting started with this? I can, I can chime in briefly. I would say try to make use of the tools that you like are most easily accessible to you. So I originally, I have like very basic um, programming knowledge and like JavaScript, but I, and I had tried to do it that way and just, it was way too complicated for me. And so I ended up just um, switching to like a video editing, which was maybe not as precise as I wanted it to be, but kind of got the point across. And I think getting started and getting that momentum with a tool that you can make use of effectively, even if it's not, quite exactly what you want it to do is better than like going down a rabbit hole and just being like frustrated and stuck all the time. I think getting it going and then because I think projects like this kind of always in the end will require collaboration. And so to try to get the point enough so that a collaborator could help you to get it to that final stage that you really want is kind of the key. I don't know if anyone has contrasting or other suggestions, but I completely agree. Uh, for me, it was um... Like my thing was animation software, which I had no experience with. And it was finding something that was in line with what I already knew. Um, it looked like a, DA, uh, I used Adobe Animate and it looked like a DAW. Um, so it's really just however you can make it happen, make it happen. Um, there's no, there are no shortcuts. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of uh, groundwork. To, to get this this stuff out, yeah. Yeah, we have wonderful resources through ACAD um, and our new film studies program, I think are, is gonna, and, and the relocation of theater to, um, to the music end of campus, I think are gonna offer a lot of new possibilities for creative productions in the future. Um, there are a couple of comments regarding the, um, the relationship of audiovisual performance to outreach among the deaf community. And this is something that actually came up in our class um, earlier this semester. There's two comments. Um, Courtney Shepler says, to add to this and to connect back to the deaf community, this audiovisual idea would allow for increased accessibility for music goers. Donovan Rice says, Paul, when I first read about this learning opportunity, I thought about the deaf community automatically and hoped someone would touch on that. I think it could very much encourage their participation if they are discouraged by the fact they cannot hear a production. I think visuals would make it more inclusive and enjoyable for everyone. Good, well, we are almost at time. Um, let me look to see if I am 
uh, we had an interesting conversation come or an interesting question come up. Um, well, I understand the scientific underpinnings of these ideas. Can anyone speak to the occult inspiration for these ideas? Um, and this is something that I've looked into because of my own research on Alexander Scriabin, who was um, a, co a composer living in the early 20th century who wrote the first color symphony. And um, much of it was inspired by his readings of theosophy which equated a kind of a, uh, a learned synesthetic experience with clairvoyance. So he was cultivating this within himself and um, he created a scheme of um, colors that represented tonalities and then um, wrote a composition that used these tonalities and, and it had this visual element with the shifting colors that operated on different levels of musical structure. Um, and so he was very much inspired by, um, by this idea of that audiovisual experience could um, heighten the senses to such a degree that you could actually train yourself to get um, to kind of acquire synesthesia. And this was sort of a higher um, state of, of perception um, in this literature. And Kandinsky was also very much inspired by theosophy. And so this was one of the motivations um, behind his, um, his um, inspiration, looking to music to inform some of his visual compositions. There's a real rich literature there on um, audio visuality of the early 20th century and um, ideas of synesthesia and clairvoyance. Great, so, um, so uh, this is a really great comment from John Croyle. Forgive my pedestrian comment, but aren't we talking about orchestral performances changing to include the visuals such as other pop concerts have been um, performing all the while joining the 21st century? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, personally, uh, Though I think that when we're coming from the academic field, we tend to have a more uh, direct and purposeful approach to how we represent things visually. But no, that's a great point. I mean, how many, you know, pop concerts have we seen that have a visual element? Uh, they're, you know, projecting all this stuff to us. So um, no, that's, that's really interesting. But I think I think maybe if we can make a difference, it's that in the academic field, we have a bit more intention, perhaps. But that's maybe my yeah, I, I would push back on that a little bit. Um, having known some designers who work for uh, pop musicians, it's extremely intentional. Um, but what I think it goes back to is this um, is this idea of inviting audiences in and creating an immersive experience of sound and visual sensation. And, um, and what we know about, about going to a pop concert is that it's just completely immersive. You've got very loud sounds often and you know, very uh, you know, um, active visuals that are just creating this, this sense of awe. Um, and I think that is the future for classical music as well. Um, you know, in, in these very uh, uh, multifarious forms. Okay, we are almost at time. Um, I'd like to invite each panelist to offer a closing thought or if there's something that um, they've seen in one of these Q and A's that they'd like to touch on. We have just a couple minutes. And maybe we'll just um, offer, go around and offer our thanks to the attendees. Thank you so much for all your wonderful yeah, questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for your beautiful questions. I was answering a question in the chat and didn't have time to gather my closing thoughts, but thank you all so much for coming and for your interest in these projects. <laughs> okay, goodbye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.